Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab, all on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here. We really appreciate your time um, for our discussion of defense against the dark arts in space. My name is Victoria Sampson, and I'm the Washington Office Director of the Secure World Foundation. Um, Secure World Foundation is a nonprofit organization whose mission it is to work with governments, industry, and international organizations and civil society to develop and promote ideas and actions to achieve a secure, sustainable, and peaceful use of outer space. We promote a global cooperative approach to push for best practices and norms of behavior to make sure that space is accessible to and usable for all over the long term. And so I'd like to point out that this says it's an SWF event, but really and truly this is um, co-hosted with our very good colleagues at CSIS's um, Aerospace Security Project. This is a follow-up to the counter space threat assessment that each of our organizations released earlier this month. These um, threat assessments are complementary um, and discuss potential threats to the space assets and capabilities that everyone depends upon. Um, they are available on SWF and CSIS's websites. Last week, our two organizations co-hosted a discussion examining the nature of the threat to space capabilities. Of course, it's not enough to identify the problem. We hope to come up with some solutions. And that's, of course, what do we do about these threats to space? Uh, we have an excellent panel today that I hope will shed some light on this representing a broad spectrum of possible responses, including active and passive defenses, strategy and policy measures, and of course, diplomatic initiatives. We have fantastic speakers today. Um, we have Todd Harrison, Director of, De of Defense Budget Analysis and Director of the Aerospace Security Project at CSIS. Frank Rose, Co-Director of the Center for Security Strategy and Technology at the Brookings Institution. Rajaswari Pillai Rajagopalan, Director of the Center for St Security Strategy and Technology at the Observer Research Foundation, and David Edmondson, Policy Head, Space Security and Advanced Threats, British Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Uh, please note, uh, we do have the chat open for discussions, but we'd love for everyone to put your questions in the Q&A. We're going to give enough time to have a really good discussion with our panelists, so please be thinking of questions you can put in there. We'll pick them up in a few minutes. Um, I'd also like to point out that this event is being recorded and is on the record. So with that, um, we'll start off with a Todd, who will discuss CSIS, CSIS's excellent report, Defense Against the Dark Arts in Space, Protecting Space Systems from Counter Space Weapons. Todd, the floor is yours. Thank you, Victoria, uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, so glad you could join us uh, again for many of you this week. Uh, as a follow-up to last week's discussion. Uh, I'm going to walk through some of the highlights and interesting uh, findings from our report uh, that our team at CSIS published last month. It's called Defense Against the Dark Arts in Space, Protecting Space Systems from Counter Space Weapons. Uh, and I wanna uh, make sure to acknowledge up front my co-authors, Caitlin Johnson and McKenna Young, uh, who worked on that project as well. Uh, and Doug Lavero, who wrote the foreword to the report and helped with some of the scenarios uh, that we used uh, as part of that analysis. Um, I'm gonna jump right into it. Uh, and you know, we did this report to look at this from a military operational perspective. Uh, what are the things that the military can do to help protect its space systems from different types of threats? So we were looking more at, you know, what are the architectural defenses? What are technical defenses? How can you change your operations? Those types of uh, actions the military can take uh, in order to, you know, better protect its space systems. Now, you know, the first thing you have to do when you start thinking about how do you defend yourself against attack is you got to think through what could actually you know cause a conflict to begin or extend into space and so you know in the the fourth chapter of the report we looked in detail at what are the range of objectors uh, of objectives excuse me an attacker might have uh, for wanting to extend conflict into space and then what are the objectives a defender might have uh, you know in trying to defend its space system so when you look at the uh, objectives an attacker might have, 
Um, it could be simply to inflict economic harm uh, on an adversary, right? Uh, you know, many of our uh, space systems, military, civilian, commercial, uh, you know, actually are used for a wide range of uh, economic purposes, right? GPS is a great example. It's a military space system. It's operated 24 seven by the United States Space Force. Uh, but much of our economy depends on the navigation and the timing signals provided by GPS. Um, another reason an attacker might want to go after someone's space systems is to signal resolve uh, in a conflict on the ground or to deter uh, an adversary from conflict on the ground. So, you know, an example here, just a hypothetical example, if there's a, a, a China-Taiwan scenario, you know, China, of course, would not want the United States to get involved in that. You know, a way that China might try to deter U.S. involvement uh, is to launch some sort of uh, an attack against U.S. space systems to show that they're serious, to show the you know, potential consequences. Now, the type of attack you might want to launch in this, uh, if, if this is your objective, likely you'd want to do something that's reversible, something that you can turn on and off, such as you know, electronic forms of attack. Right. Uh, another objective an attacker might have uh, is once you're at, you know, uh, once you're in a conflict or conflict appears to be imminent, is to attack space systems in order to disrupt the sensor to shooter kill chain. That is the the battle networks that the military uses uh, to carry out operations and to project power. So, you know, many of these sensor to shooter kill chains are either enabled by space or run through space. So that's going to make them a target. Um, Attacking space systems can also be used as a penetration aid to allow terrestrial systems to operate more effectively. So, for example, if a country you know is planning on launching a you know a salvo missile attack, and one of the things they might want to do is disable uh, missile warning satellites, and that will increase the odds that their missiles will make it into their uh, intended target. Of course, a more extreme objective a nation might have uh, in beginning or, or extending a conflict into space is to permanently alter the balance of power in space, basically to roll back another country's space capabilities uh, in a way that they cannot easily recover from and may never recover from. Um, now, if you flip it on the other side, you know, what are the range of objectives a defender might have uh, you know, in a conflict that extends into space. Well, the first objective is, you know, you might want to be able to, to defend your space systems so that you can deter conflict from ever extending into space in the first place. You know, I would argue that right now, uh, the vulnerabilities that many U.S. military space systems have uh, are actually inviting conflict. They make conflict more likely. When you make yourself a more difficult target uh, by building in protections and defenses, that makes it less likely an adversary is going to try to attack them. Um, now, another objective uh, for defending your space systems might be to just buy time for operations in other domains to be effective. Uh, so, you know, not necessarily trying to have a foolproof defense um, and be able to stop every form of attack, but just give yourself enough time that forces in other domains can roll back the capabilities of an adversary. Um, you know, a, a more, you know, uh, challenging objective for a defender would be to actually defeat an attack on its space systems while the attack is in progress and restore capabilities uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, and of course, you know, a defender could also have a more extreme objective of permanently rolling back an adversary's space and counter space capabilities so that they don't pose a threat in the future, even once conflict subsides. So, you know, when you're looking at what types of defenses you might want to use in space, you've got to take into account, you know, what do you, you know, the, the context of the situation in which they would be used. What are the objectives of the attacker likely to be? What are your objectives as a defender uh, likely to be in that scenario? So, you know, what we also did in the report, if you look at chapter three of the report, we walked through in detail uh, all the different types of defenses that you can build into your space systems. And so we divided them into active defenses and passive defenses. So passive defenses, generally speaking, uh, are things where you try to make yourself harder to attack, um, uh, make it more difficult for an adversary to attack you. We categorized them into three bins uh, and arguably some of these defenses 
could belong in, in more than one of these bins, but we categorized them as architectural defenses, the ways that you can change your satellite architectures uh, that make them more difficult to attack or more resilient uh, to attack if they uh, do fall under attack. So that can include disaggregated uh, constellations, distributed constellations, proliferated constellations, diversified architectures where maybe you're using multiple orbits, maybe you've got an air layer uh, in addition to your space layer. Uh, and then don't forget your ground stations. They are a critical part of your architecture as well, building you know, redundant mobile or hardened ground stations. Now for your technical defenses, um, you know, this is where as an engineer, I really like this part. Uh, what are the uh, types of technical defenses you can build in that are passive that make you harder to attack? Uh, a big one is just better space domain awareness. Uh, and that actually enhances almost all of the other types of defenses that you have. The more that you know it's going on in the space and environment, uh, the better you'll be able to defend against it. Uh, related to that, space-based radio frequency mapping, so understanding who is emitting, who's communicating from where and to whom. Um, uh, and then you can build in things that make you more resistant to electronic forms of attack, like antenna nulling, adaptive filtering, uh, electromagnetic shielding uh, for your satellites, filtering and shuttering for uh, remote sensing satellites, uh, jam-resistant waveforms, things like spread spectrum frequency hopping, uh, and of course, uh, for you know, resistance against uh, certain forms of cyber attack, you want to always have encryption and air gap systems, especially in your ground stations. Operational defenses are things that you can do where you change the way you operate your satellites in order to make them harder to attack. So stealth, uh, you know, there are some technical components to stealth, but a big portion of stealth in space is changing the way you operate. Uh, so it's harder for people to track you. Uh, rapid deployment of constellations uh, or new space capabilities. So that's keeping it on the ground uh, and launching it only when you need it. Uh, and so then an adversary doesn't necessarily know what the capability is uh, and they won't be able to build it into their calculus uh, prior to conflict. Reconstitution is being able to quickly replace systems as they are damaged or degraded. Uh, you can also use deception and decoys. So trying to conceal uh, what a satellite's actual purpose and capabilities are, or using decoys to confuse an adversary. Uh, and maneuver, um, that's something that actually gets talked about a lot by Air Force leaders, because I think a lot of them come from the fighter pilot community, uh, <clears throat> where ma maneuver is certainly an effective way uh, to avoid you know, adversary missiles. In space, it's, the physics are very different. Uh, and maneuver is not likely to be that effective on its own. If you can blind the sensors of an ASAT warhead and maneuver out of the way, great. Just maneuvering though, that ASAT warhead is likely gonna be able to outmaneuver you. Um, then we also looked at active uh, space defenses. Now this is where it starts to make people a bit more uncomfortable because what you know, one country may intend as a defensive counter space measure uh, might also be used uh, or could be used in an offensive capability. Uh, so you know, we categorize these into your active defenses that are based in space and those that are based on Earth. So space-based active defenses include things like jamming and spoofing that you can do from a satellite to confuse the sensors uh, on an ASAT system. So if a warhead's coming at you, uh, if you can jam its radar or confuse its radar, uh, then you know, it may miss you. Laser dazzling or blindings are similar to that. Uh, you want to, you know, be able to dazzle or blind, um, you know, infrared or optical sensors uh, so that they can't effectively track you and target you. You could have a shootback system, either kinetic or non-kinetic here, um, where you try to take out, you know, physically destroy an ASAT warhead that may be coming towards you. And you know, the last one here is a physical seizure capability. That is the ability to grab another object in space, an uncooperative object, um, and you know, take it to a safe orbit or safely dispose of it so it no longer poses a threat. Now, your terrestrial base active defenses, you, know, you could launch you know, cyber attacks against another country's counter space systems. Uh, you could use terrestrial base jamming and spoofing uh, to confuse their systems. Uh, so that they can't find you as easily. Um, you could use a direct ascent ASAT weapon against another country's co-orbital ASAT weapon. So you could shoot down their uh, killer satellite. Uh, of course, you know, there are many drawbacks to that as well. You're still producing lots of space debris 
you know, similar to, you know, in a kinetic shootback system, you're still going to be producing space debris. Um, so that's not going to be desirable. Um, uh, and then, of course, you know, you could use conventional air, sea, and land-based kinetic attacks against another country's space situational awareness facilities or space launch facilities. Uh, or if you can locate them, they uh, go after directly uh, their counter space weapons on the ground, right? So you've got a range here of defenses. Now, you know, that's where you have to stop and think, okay, which types of defenses are appropriate against, you know, which types of threats. So on the left-hand column here, you see, you know, all the different categories of threats that we actually talked about last week, um, you know, looking at global counter space um, uh, capabilities. Um, and, you know, all of the different types of active and passive defenses that I just quickly went over there. Uh, and, you know, just because an area is highlighted doesn't mean that that defense is going to help you against all types uh, of uh, counter space weapons in a particular category, but it could help you with some of them. You can see, though, glancing across the chart um, that, you know, there are a wide range of uh, defenses, defensive options available against kinetic physical forms of attack not nearly as many types of defenses available against cyber forms of attack. Um, so bottom line, you know, I'm not gonna go through each of these in detail, uh, but in our report at the end, we have seven main recommendations that we make. The number one recommendation though, uh, is to improve space domain awareness capabilities. Uh, that's the number one thing the United States and its allies and partners around the world can do to better protect our space systems. You can't protect against something if you don't know it's there, if you can't care for, you know, accurately characterize uh, what's going on in space. Um, uh, the other thing I would point out is recommendation number three here. Um, we've got to transition to new space architectures that use a combination of distribution, proliferation, and diversification of orbits. Uh, that will complicate the, uh, the targeting problem for adversaries that will make our systems much more resilient than they are today. Uh, and ultimately, I think it will reduce the likelihood uh, that we will ever see uh, conflict in space. So I'm going to stop there uh, and just say, if you want to you know, read the full report, it's available on our website. If you go to aerospace.csis.org, uh, you can find Defense Against the Dark Arts, where we talk about all the things covered here today. You can also find our space threat assessment for 2021. And I would also recommend to you um, a, a paper published this past summer by Caitlin Johnson, A Balance of Instability, um, you know, looking at you know, how arms control when it comes to direct descent ASAT weapons in particular can actually uh, affect nuclear deterrence. Uh, so a lot of great content there, uh, recommend it to you. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Victoria. Thank you, Todd. Great, um, really interesting overview. Looking forward to getting more into discussion of that in the Q&A, but we'll move on to our next speaker now, Frank Rose. Frank? Frank, uh, thanks so much for having me today. It's great to be with you. Uh, you know, as our CSIS colleagues have noted in their excellent report, uh, the threat to US and allied space systems is growing. Uh, indeed, Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, noted the gro growing anti-satellite threat in her testimony yesterday before the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, on China, she noted, quote, Beijing continues to train its military space elements in field new destructive and non-destructive ground-based and space-based anti-satellite weapons, end quote. And on Russia, she noted, quote, Russia continues to train its military space elements in field new ASAT weapons to disrupt and degrade US and allied space capabilities. That said, the fundamental question is this, what should the United States and its allies do in response? You know, given the diverse nature of the challenge, I believe it will require a comprehensive response that includes military uh, and diplomatic uh, elements. I'm gonna focus my brief remarks on the diplomatic uh, arena, specifically norms of behavior and risk reduction measures in outer space. Uh, I want to be clear, norms of behavior and risk reduction measures will not prevent Russia and China from developing ASAT weapons. To the contrary, as long as the U.S. is dependent on space systems for military operations, 
uh, potential adversaries are likely to continue to develop and deploy ASAT weapons. Therefore, from my perspective, the key challenge we face uh, in space is how do we main, uh, manage competition in a way that reduces the risk of inadvertent escalation and help maintain, helps maintain the long-term sustainability and safety of the space environment. Let me share with you three kind of near-term steps I think the United States could take to, to help achieve these two goals. Uh, as a first step, I think the United States needs to rebuild uh, its bilateral dialogue on space security with both Russia and China. You know, now while diplomatic and military to military dialogues are not ends uh, upon in themselves, structured dialogues do offer an opportunity to improve understanding, reduce risk, and send deterrent messages. Uh, with regards to Russia, I think there's actually been some good progress uh, on this issue over the past year. Indeed, last summer in Vienna, uh, Austria, the U.S. and Russia held their first space security dialogue uh, in more than six years. And according to press reports, uh, that dialogue has continued at lower levels uh, during the Biden administration. China, unfortunately, is a different story. It appears that the last bilateral dialogue between the US and China on outer space uh, occurred uh, in 2016. Indeed, uh, it was the US-China space security talks, which I chaired as Assistant Secretary of State. Uh, Reestablishing a dialogue with China on space security, I believe should be a high priority for the Biden administration. Uh, and that um, dialogue could take place as a separate dialogue or part of a larger uh, discussion of strategic issues. But the bottom line is we need to maintain lines of communications with both Russia and China. Uh, now, let me talk about some specific uh, norms that I think the United States should consider. Um, one issue where all spacefaring nations, I think, agree uh, is that the inter national community needs to find a way to slow the growth of orbital debris uh, in the various Earth orbits. Um, therefore, strengthening the norm against additional debris generating events like China's 2007 ASAP test should be, in my view, the United States' top priority with regards to the development of norms of behavior. Uh, and there are a number of approach, approaches that the United States could take to achieve this. Um, for example, the easiest would be to declare a unilateral moratorium saying that the United States will refrain from debris generating ASAT tests as long as others uh, refrain. Uh, Another option would be to do a bilateral political statement with another country like Russia and China, uh, saying that uh, we will not conduct these types of events and encourage others to, to make similar statements. Uh, a third option uh, would be to kind of have a multilateral statement, for example, the P5 members of the permanent uh, of the UN Security Council could come up with a declaration or perhaps the G20. And finally, um, the US could propose negotiating a legally binding treaty that would prohibit debris generating anti-satellite tests in outer space. Indeed, uh, Victoria and her colleague, Bryden Whedon have an article proposing just that, which was published about a month or two ago in Arms Control Today. So my point here is, is not to endorse any particular uh, uh, approach over the other, but what I'm trying to uh, say is that there are, are a number of near-term steps that the United States in conjunction with other nations can take to strengthen that norm against debris generating uh, events in outer space because debris does not discriminate. It's a threat to the space uh, craft of all nations. Uh, another area 
of concern is the issue of rendezvous in proximity operations. Uh, in recent years, the United States has expressed concerns about Russian and Chinese satellites maneuvering close to US and other uh, satellites operating in various orbits. Um, uh, commenting on some recent Russian satellite maneuvers near US satellites last year, General Jay Raymond, uh, the Chief of Space Operations at the US Space Force stated, quote, we view this behavior as unusual and disturbing. And this quote has the potential to create a dangerous situation in space. I fully agree with General Raymond. Uh, these types of maneuvers have do have the potential to increase miscalculations and misperceptions in outer space uh, and could also lead to collisions that create more debris. Uh, therefore, I think the United States should seriously examine whether it might be possible to develop some useful norms with regards to rendezvous and proximity operations in outer space. This will not be easy, but you know, given the recent events we've seen, especially from the Russians and Chinese, I think it would be useful. And on a related note, uh, the United States government, both in the nuclear posture review uh, and in uh, former Assistant Secretary of State Chris Ford's uh, address to CSIS last year, uh, they've expressed increasing concerns about the ASAT threat to nuclear command control and communication systems. Um, and, you know, that is a very, very dangerous thing uh, to have, um, which could really take a crisis in a place we don't want to go. Uh, so I think when you're looking at rendezvous and proximity operations, I think examining that whole issue of space based NC3 would also be useful. Um, so let me conclude with the following points. Um, Russia, China, and other nations are developing ASAC capabilities because they believe space represents an asymmetric vulnerability of the US. Uh, I expect that Russia and China will continue to develop and deploy a full range of ASAC capabilities. Uh, as a result, ASAC weapons are not going away. Therefore, again, the key challenge we face is how do we manage this competition in outer space in a way that reduces the risk of inadvertent escalation and helps maintain the long-term sustainability of the space environment. I be believe that the three steps that I outlined today, reestablishing bilateral security dialogues with Russia and China, strengthening the norm against debris generating events in outer space and exploring uh, the development of norms regarding rendezvous and uh, proximity operations could be some useful steps to help us achieve these goals. But again, they are only one element of a broader comprehensive approach, which includes military and diplomatic elements. And with that, I'll stop there. Thank you, Frank. All right, our next speaker will be Raji. Raji, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you, Victoria. And uh, many thanks to the organizers, both the Secure World Foundation and the CSIS uh, for having me here at this panel. Um, so let me, uh, of course, I agree with the two speakers in terms of the uh, threats and challenges that have been identified and possible ways that Frank also outlined. So clearly global governance of outer space is increasingly a problem. Uh, lack of consensus uh, among the major powers uh, has uh, prevented any possible solution, working out any possible solution in this regard. Uh, though there are, have been some, of course, there have been some legal instruments in place, including starting with the foundational uh, Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Uh, I think these were built for a different era and they are proving to be in Africa. They are showing their age. So we need clearly 
new rules of the road uh, to address the contemporary challenges in a sense. And with greater utilization of the space, many of the old rules, uh, rules of engagement have to be need to be reviewed and new rules need to be, uh, uh, old rules need to be reviewed and new rules need to be developed. But uh, I think the problems that we are seeing is that one is that, of course, an increasing reliance on space systems would also, especially for national security purposes, uh, leads to simultaneous uh, emergence of the counter space capabilities, making the space domain extremely competitive and contested than ever before in the sense. Uh, there, there have been competition during the Cold War, but the kind of competition that you're seeing, the willingness among the states to uh, deploy and test some of these capabilities uh, that you're seeing today is much more impactful, much more serious in a sense. So uh, especially when I look at some of the recent developments since the anti-satellite test uh, demonstrations resumed in January 2007, for instance, uh, there has been considerable competitive security pressure on other states to demonstrate their own ki kinetic ASAT capabilities, as well as develop other countermeasures. Uh, and of course, the challenges are not limited to counter space capabilities. There are other issues such as new actors, non-state actors, space debris, overpopulated debris, causing radio frequency interference issues of spectrum allocation, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, problems of access to space, especially for a lot of new entrants, new players, I think this is also being seen as an important problem. All these make space governance a lot more difficult. And added to this is the perception that these are problems of the future, whereas they represent a clear and present uh, danger today. Um, so new rules and norms need to be developed, which should involve defining and communicating clear boundaries of responsible behavior in space. Uh, however, the efforts to develop old rules, uh, revise new old rules or formulate new ones have seen very little progress, like I said in the beginning, primarily because of the great power politics today. There is not even an agreement among the major powers on what are the major uh, main security threats. There is a huge divergence in whether it's the arms race in outer space, which is the biggest problem, or is it the space debris, which is the biggest challenge, or is it the radio frequency interface. So there is not even a clearer and clear understanding among the major powers. Or a, a or an agreement uh, in terms of identifying the challenges first and foremost, and then come to the second aspect of developing effective rules to address those particular things. Uh, the fact that space is vital to both civilian and military operations, again, heighten the danger of inadvertent escalation and conflict if there is, for instance, uh, if there is a disruption or a denial of service during a, uh, during a period of heightened tensions. Uh, and even if the accident was a natural incident due to a mechanical failure, it is going to be seen as a, uh, it's, it's, it could potentially escalate into a major conflict because of the heightened uh, sense of insecurities in a sense. Um, and second, of course, uh, and I think the difficulties are coming about pri primarily because of a few different factors. One is, of course, uh, at a time of there is a great uh, renewed emphasis on hard power capabilities, including in outer space. Um, uh, states have begun to, and the, one of the indication of this renewed competition is, of course, the uh, emphasis on hard power, uh, counter space capabilities, and so on and so forth. Second is the setting up of dedicated space forces, uh, such as the United States, by France, by India, uh, China, and Russia to have their own specialized space institutional architecture in the space military space domain. So this is again one manifestation of some of the problems that we see, which also make it more difficult in terms of developing effective rules. These do have an impact on the global governance mechanisms. Second is, of course, the balance of power dynamics and the great power rivalry. Uh, as a result of that, again, making uh, uh, outer space governance extremely challenging. Space has become another domain where the terrestrial politics and the competition are playing out. Uh, for instance, take just to give an example, the military competition between India and China uh, is finding a reflection now in the space race between the two states. This is again important in the context of counter space discussions because many states today are approaching space from a security perspective, relying on outer space to strengthen their strategic and national security capabilities. And uh, so this is going to play, play out. A third aspect, like I touched upon in the beginning, is the greater willingness among a large number of countries to engage in the development and possible use of these counter space capabilities uh, than we have seen during the Cold War era. Uh, and I think this is going to create a, 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 big, a bigger problem in a sense. So in, clearly, I think the, the need for new rules of the road, I think that's very, very clear. Uh, outer space have 
have grown considerably over the last few decades and new types of activities, technological developments um, are not covered by the existing treaties and arrangements. Uh, OST uh, is one of the foundational agreements, but the fact is that uh, it leaves out an, uh, an entire array of weapons outside of the uh, outside of the uh, its purview. Uh, it only prohibits the placement of the weapons of mass destruction and not conventional weapons, which is a significant drawback, especially when you look at the contemporary challenges. Um, uh, so that's going to be one set of issues, major set of issues. Second is, of course, the definitional aspects with regard to that uh, that uh, play out in the existing treaties and mechanisms. Um, the expansive interpretation of the peaceful use of outer space, defensive use of outer space, who is an astronaut, what is a, um, uh, what's a space weapon, all of these are going to be uh, complicating uh, the governance measures in a sense. Uh, of course, an effective space regime would ensure security of space, order, predictability, stability, and sustainability. And I think these are all noble goals uh, accepted by most states, at least on, uh, on in terms of their statements and rhetoric. But the reality on the ground is very different. Uh, lack of confidence among the major powers, absence of a decisive leadership in shaping the discourse around the rules of the road have also been part of the problem in developing uh, effective rules uh, space norms. Um, and I think, uh, like I said, the changing balance of power, because especially when you look at the 60s and 70s, when treaty making was a major part of the uh, global governance aspect, you had two decisive powers, both the US and the USSR. They both had an inherent interest in developing uh, uh, certain rules, certain uh, certain uh, restricting measures that would stop other countries from developing these capabilities and so on and so forth. But today you have a large number of players, the spread of technology, proliferation of technology across a number of different countries countries have also added to the complexities that we see today. Uh, second, I think a uh, major difference in terms of the, uh, the, the approach to space security regime. One group of countries that led by the US, of course, uh, feels that given the kind of international political climate that plays out today, developing legally binding measures are going to be difficult. And they, there is a preference to work out political measures, pursue political measures as a first step at least, uh, before, uh, including norms of responsible behaviors, transparency and confidence building measures, I look at engaging in processes such as the UN governmental group of governmental measures, uh, experts, GG process, and so on and so forth. But uh, you have another set of countries led by China and Russia, which believe that legally binding uh, measures are the only way to deal with space security challenges. And I think that's a serious problem. Uh, there was some discussion about possibly coming out with uh, some sort of an understanding as to how you might have even a legally binding TCBMs and so on and so forth, but that hasn't gone very far. But again, you need to think about these issues in a much more, uh, uh, much more um, serious manner because the space threats, the security threats are growing many fold. And the, uh, the usable orbits in space are limited. Space is a limited commodity. And therefore, you need to think about how to um, uh, restrict a certain. And the last GG, for instance, in 2018, 19, was a clear demonstration of the difficulties in developing consensus among the major powers. So my final two points would be to work towards smaller technical agreements rather than looking at overarching all encompassing agreements because building consensus among the major, among all the powers uh, involving uh, such a large frame of a number of issues would be very, very difficult. So go for, maybe it will be temporary, but sm start with smaller technical agreements uh, and then build up the support and the confidence among the major powers to work out something longer term. Uh, second issue is to look out for middle space stars to come together I work on again technology aided measures that could be used at a later stage gradually to persuade major powers also to come on board. Uh, third aspect, uh, again, something that cannot be emphasized enough is to have increasing the number of dialogue either through bilateral channels, which uh, Frank uh, emphasized on, uh, but you have to do bilateral, maybe uh, multilateral ones, all of them need to go hand in hand and you cannot wait for, and track one, track 1.5, track two dialogues. You need multiple channels of dialogue and communication uh, open if we have to be able to uh, develop some sort of an understanding and confidence in each other. I'll stop here and I'll be happy to take on any questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Raji. And I will point out that Raji's calling us in New Delhi, so it's very late for her, so we do appreciate her insights. And now our last speaker is calling from 
you know, it's not quite as late for him, but it is late. Dave Edmondson was calling in London or outside London. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, the joy of going last is that everybody else has eaten your lunch already. So there we go. Um, I should try and do a mixture of wrapping up a little bit and then trying to um, uh, take us on a kind of a, a little bit of a narrative of, of what we're sort of thinking of and what we think of as golden thread for the reason why we ran the resolution at the UN General Assembly last year. Uh, so those of you uh, who don't know, uh, I work for the British Foreign Office and we took the initiative in 2019 to start thinking about a new approach uh, at the United Nations General Assembly under the Paros heading, so preventing an arms race in outer space, uh, and trying to look at uh, a little bit talking about what Raji said, you know, how if, if the treaty approach, as we perceive it, isn't working, then uh, what can we do instead? Um, some of you will know there was an attempt to do other GA resolutions in 2019, and, it, and, it, and we, did a, we learned an awful lot from that. So in 2020, at the end of a long uh, campaign of uh, education and, uh, and outreach, we uh, put a resolution in front of the General Assembly First Committee. and We were delighted to push back on some obstructionism from certain nations who didn't agree that that was the right place to talk about behaviours. Uh, and we succeeded uh, in the First Committee with 150 uh, odd votes and with 164 in the General Assembly itself. So to give you an idea of the numbers, that's 164 in favour and 12 against. So uh, what that really does is it gives us a, a uh, an international uh, weight behind us to keep going with this. And the reason that matters is, is partly what, what Raj has talked about and what others have spoken about as well, which is very difficult to take a new approach forwards if you've just squeaked over the line. And if you're having this argument that maybe most states think you might be right, you might be wrong. Uh, in this case, most states said, hey, you've got to give this a go because we need a new approach. If I just talk you through the UK thinking, um, essentially what we try to do is separate out those issues that are dealt with in the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Our Space away from those issues which are state threats. Um, it gets a bit tricky because uh, you can have a long argument and if you talk to or read some of the documentation that's out there, there's quite a lot of sort of space specialists who will push back on the idea that you can separate the two. Generally, we try to separate them where the space issue has a wider national security impact. So if you try and sort of, if you think as a concept, that there's this idea that space is a domain on one hand, but it's also the place through which a whole load of other national security issues uh, take place, then we try and split the issues out like that. So uh, ballistic missile defense, for example, relies on the satellites in space, we use OPIR for detection. Um, so if you were to threaten those satellites, it's less of an issue that you're threatening the satellite. It's much more of an issue of what you might mean, what the intent might be as to why you are threatening that satellite uh, that's doing OPIR or that's doing ballistic missile launch detection. If, so if you park, if you take all those space hazards, if you like space weather, um, debris for which um, I'm going to agree with Frank, but it sounds like I'm disagreeing, but I'm not. The, the, the issue here for us is the, the, what we want to stop is the effect of the creation of the debris of an ASAT. What we want to take um, separately is the existing debris. So we take existing current debris and put that into Copuos in Vienna. And we say, let's not create any new debris through a kinetic event. And we take that uh, in first committee in Geneva in the disarmament structures. So that hazard stuff, right, park that on one side, it's all done. Well, sort of, but at least conceptually it is. Um, the threats, the threats are real. I won't go through them again. You heard it last week. Todd touched on it briefly again today. Um, also about objectives and why space uh, nations might threaten space systems. Um, what is, I think, missing in the international discussion at the moment is this link between the space system, so the satellites, the ground infrastructure and the, and the links and the signals, crucially, um, to national security objectives, to our economic development, to our um, national uh, security in the sense of um, sort of what you would sort of think of as existential defence, as well as global freedom of action and being able to sail your carrier through the South China Sea and all of those sort of things that the UK is very focused on at the moment. So what we're seeing 
and I'm, and I'm going to be slightly provocative and just lay these out as statements and then people could come back at them. But I think what you're seeing is the, de the development and the deployment of threat capabilities without established doctrine of use. And so what you're seeing is a real issue at the moment where states have these abilities to threaten without knowing what the other side is feeling and thinking. So in the Cold War, there was a kind of, let's call it a gentleman's agreement between the US and Russia. And there was a sort of understanding that certain systems existed and capabilities existed. And we kind of knew who was going to use what and when. But as cyber threats have developed, as the electromagnetic interference has improved, as you know, we've got, we've got lasers that can fry a satellite, basically. Uh, and you've got co-orbital weapons that we just did not have in the 80s along with commercial rendezvous and proximity operations that again need to be identified as such and parked out of the way. Um, how do we deal with what is remaining or what is what we call perception of threat? It's a really difficult uh, issue to try and get into, uh, particularly in three minutes that I've got left. Um, but this crucial bit of perception of, in, of, of threat and of intent um, is what you get, uh, try to get to in those bilateral dialogues that Frank spoke about and in those mechanisms that uh, Rajit spoke about as well. Um, so the work we're doing is essentially trying to get agreement between states that you prevent an arms race in outer space by preventing the need to act in outer space in response to threats that could well be Earth-based or that impact on your systems that are about your existential national security. Um, so essentially, it's about understanding each other. And so what we're trying to do at the moment is have a process run through the first committee that is about nations understanding each other's doctrine, ideas and approaches much better. So uh, as many of you all know, the resolution called for states to consider the threats to think about where those threats or what those threats would impact on and then how responsible behaviors could be a useful way of avoiding miscalculation and escalation uh, and also um, in that escalation piece you have this shared understanding of the escalation ladder um, so that if you do this to my signals perhaps we're on ladder rung three if you then do this against kinetically against my satellite we automatically go to rung 12 or whatever it is um, so uh, when you, so the, so the nations are asked to study those, they're asked to submit to the United Nations Secretary General, who will write a report that will be published in October. And then we will write, uh, we will run a subsequent a follow on resolution uh, at the General Assembly First Committee in October this year at UNGA 77. And that will set up some of these discussions where nations can walk into a room and start to talk about when you do this, I feel that. Uh, when you do this, I think that. And it's very different to the treaty-based approach because what we're try not trying to do is codify that. We're trying to get common understanding, shared understandings. And then that's how you walk into the um, de-escalation ladder because you can actually have a conversation with the other state that says, I feel threatened. And they say, hopefully we didn't mean it. A uh, couple of things I'll just throw in at the end just to uh, get people thinking, um, of course, uh, we shouldn't reinvent the uh, legal environment for space. So the law of armed conflict applies in space. The UN Charter applies in space. Um, it's our view that sort of, you know, for example, a lot of the NATO agreements uh, apply in space. Uh, territoriality, Article 5, etc. You can challenge that if you like. We can have that discussion. Um, but also we started se uh, to separate uh, rendezvous activities from proximity activities. And we talk about them separately. Um, because uh, they're very different uh, threats or perception of threat. Um, if a satellite or co-orbital weapon is hanging around your asset, it's very different from if it's grappling onto it. Um, but again, it's how you have a conversation around all of those. I'm out of time. I will give it back to Victoria. I appreciate that. Um, I have been told actually that we can go a few minutes over if that's a possibility for our panelists, uh, because we've had so much really rich uh, discussion here. I'd love to be able to get into a little bit of the Q&A, um, but I will take actually the um, power of the chair just to bring up something. Um, David brought up the resolution about countries being able to give input on what they see to be um, the threat, what they see to be responsible behavior, and what do they recommend for um, positions forward. 
uh, Secure World, my organization, Secure World Foundation, actually did submit our thoughts since civil society was allowed to do that. And I wanted just to bring up, you know, just some of the highlights and the issues we thought were important for responsible behavior. Or are you saying, you know, if you're, how do you call out when someone's acting outside the norm? And, you know, the things that we listed, or they may seem kind of basic, we thought, okay, let's just come down in one place. Things like establishing norms related to operating with due regard to other space objects, providing transparency regarding plans and intentions for all activities, including military, no non-consensual close approaches, sharing information about national military budgets, um, policies and programs, particularly for dedicated military space units, Following existing legal obligations, sounds basic, but something doesn't happen very often. And along the same vein, the idea of registering space objects within a timely manner. Um, following best practices for orbital debris mitigation, even for military activities. And then finally, avoiding the deliberate creation of long-lived long orbital debris, uh, notably through avoiding the testing of kinetic weapons on orbit. So, and I, we have a section that has irresponsible behavior, but basically it's that, but the opposite. So don't do anything we just listed. Um, so yeah, so, and this is available, excuse me, on our website and we will have um, French, um, Spanish and Arabic versions up on our website um, next week. Uh, but yeah, so it's kind of, we wanted to put a mark in the place where we thought would be of interest. So with that, um, I'd like to go on to some of the questions that we've been getting a lot of in the, in the Q and A and please do continue to send them on. Um, but one that came into the um, chat is, um, I think, probably most relevant for Todd and Frank, although obviously if Raji and David have thoughts, bring it in. But um, the, um, it's from Pete Hayes, and he asked specifically, what initial and subsequent steps did the U.S. government take to accelerate the deployment of more resilient architectures and improve space mission resilience? And then probably the hard part is, what organizations and approaches should lead those efforts? So Todd or Frank, who wants to take first crack at that? Yeah, I, I'm happy to jump in there. Um, great question. And, you know, and, and I should say in terms of bringing the discussion kind of full circle here, I know the other panelists have focused mainly on diplomatic efforts and communication and sharing information. And that's absolutely essential. I talk mostly about capabilities. Capabilities actually shape what is possible diplomatically, right? Uh, and so, you know, you can have all sorts of great negotiations, but if you don't have capabilities to back it up for verification uh, or to just prove to another country that it's in their best interest uh, to come to the negotiating table, diplomacy is not going to go very far. And, and so far it hasn't, you know, quite frankly, uh, gone very far. Uh, but we should, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try in the future. But I think a prerequisite to getting to some of these diplomatic answers is the United States itself has to feel more secure, has to build better protections. Now, to the question directly, um, you know, I think the United States is beginning to go down that track to build more resilient uh, space architectures, more resilient space systems. I think what the Space Development Agency in particular is doing and building uh, proliferated low Earth orbit constellations for things like missile sensing, for data transport, I think that is a step in the right direction. Uh, you know, what's the right place to do that within our, our organizational structure? I think it needs to be something like the Space Development Agency. Now that agency is going to move over and it should move over to be under the Space Force within the next few years. I would actually do that sooner rather than later. Uh, but, you know, because you want to have a coherent chain of command, right? Uh, in terms of building our space capabilities, that was the whole point of creating the Space Force. You don't want to have these extra agencies uh, sitting around out there. But the risk uh, is you don't want the legacy capabilities um, and, and all of the program offices that build those legacy architectures to squash the new ideas that are coming along. They can coexist, they should coexist, uh, but I think there's going to be some cultural resistance uh, within you know, the longstanding uh, bureaucracy uh, of the Space and Missile Systems Center uh, to actually embrace and allow these new architectures to flourish. You know, let me just add it with, I agree with Todd that, you know, diplomacy works best and is most effective when it's closely connected with military capabilities. Uh, so I think, you know, that's something that we need to keep in mind 
as we move forward with the development of norms. And really that was the essential piece uh, or point of my presentation is that you're going to require a comprehensive response that brings together all elements of national power if we're gonna manage this increasingly competitive domain. Uh, the only thing I would add to uh, Todd's point with regards to resiliency is that I think as the United States moves forward, the Department of Defense and the intelligence community need to continue to look uh, for ways to partner with the commercial sector. They are doing some really fascinating things in the commercial sector. And I think the National Security Space Committee uh, community could really uh, benefit from working and learning from the commercial space sector. The good news is that General Raymond and his team at the um, Space Force are taking this to heart and are moving in this direction. So let me stop there. Thank you. Roger or David, I mean, this discussion of mission assurance and resiliency must be coming up in your countries as well. I mean, India is starting the Defense Space Agency and the UK is starting up their Space Command. Um, what, do, what are you guys thinking in terms of this? How are you guys prioritizing this sort of mission resiliency? No, absolutely. It is uh, part of the uh, thinking for sure. And uh, India has been debating this for quite some time, especially I think the Chinese ASATUS was a wake up call uh, for India in terms of the kind of challenges that India needs to be prepared for and so on and so forth. Uh, but it took India uh, almost like a 12, yeah, a dozen years to uh, finally respond to uh, with an ASAT test and with a clear message to China. Uh, but I think uh, I think it's very clear that one ASAT test is not going to build up the deterrence capability, the resilience and kind of things. And I think that's an entirely different set of measures that India is still to develop. But this is uh, something that it's a work in progress. Uh, the DRDO, the Defense Research and Development Organization has come out making a lot of different statements. But again, I think it's, uh, uh, it's still a long way before India gets to develop developing uh, um, uh, full-fledged resilience and deterrence capabilities in space. But India is beginning to do that, developing those capabilities, but also uh, um, sort of building up the institutional capacity, institutional arrangements that need to be done uh, within in terms of different space agency, different space research organization, which is another body that's coming up, similar to the kind of capabilities that are required for in, for in the space sector. So the, uh, the whole lot of R&D for the space sector will be done by that particular institution. So there are uh, building blocks are getting ready. Things are getting moving in the right direction in some sense uh, from a national security perspective when you look at it. But I think uh, uh, many of the norms are also getting diluted. And I think that's a, that's a risk uh, in this uh, in this particular, it's a slippery slope that we are all in. Um, so uh, yeah, certain progress in that direction from a national security perspective, but I think there are, it's still a long way to go. Indeed, David. Thank you. I mean, I, I think a, a couple of very quick points. One is, um, for those of you who haven't seen it, the UK recently published our integrated review of security, defence and development. Um, and the important bit in that is that uh, whilst we talk about space, it's, it's understanding and situating space within an, an awful lot of other things. You know, why do we care about systems in space? I spoke about that earlier. Um, so it's about capabilities, cross domain capabilities, because in most instances, a threat to a space system will be responded to in another domain um, of our choosing and at a time of our choosing. So um, these the, the holistic sort of approach and shaping the adversary, we call that modern deterrence. Um, and you'll see that running through the, the integrated review. So I just bring us back, um, I think, really to say, yes, it's great. This conversation is about space, but this we need to situate this within other conversations as well. Great. Thank you. Um... One interesting question that came in from Mariel Borowitz says, and this is something I think is foundational to any discussion, uh, whether it's threat or behavior in space, is how do we keep an eye on things? Uh, what are the priorities for improving space situational awareness uh, capabilities? Do we need better accuracy? Do we need more data sharing? Do we need more international cooperation? What sort of priorities should we have and how do we tie this to whatever international agreements we come to, whether they're legally binding or not? Uh, who wants to take first crack at that one? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in here because you know, this was one of the top recommendations 
uh, in our analysis. Um, and I think it's kind of all of the above, uh, right? Uh, you need more data sources, uh, it gives you better accuracy. You need to be looking at in multiple phenomenologies. Um, it's not just about identifying there's an object here and here's how it's moving. It's also, you need to have a better understanding of what is that object doing? What is it capable of doing? What capabilities does it have? Um, uh, you know, and, and how is it, you know, operating? How is it being used, right? And then I think data sharing and transparency is very important as well. Uh, this is just for safety of flight. We need better data, you know, transparency so that everyone can have a good common uh, picture of what's going on in the environment and what's likely to be a problem uh, in the near future. But then also for building trust and, and better coordination, especially among, you know, allies, we need to be able to share some of that higher classification level of data uh, so that you know our allies know what we know and and can understand you know when we say something is a threat or when we say something has happened that they have the background they have the data they have the insight to confirm it for themselves and say oh yeah that that did happen that you know uh, I understand what the concern is is here, because otherwise we run the risk of an adversary being able to take actions in space that actually split alliances and split partnerships, because we might not have that same common picture of what's happening in the environment. Thank you. What about our international colleagues? Is data sharing and SDA, as I say, is that a priority for you as well? Shall I? Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Uh, thanks. I I think uh, I entirely agree with uh, what Todd said, and I think that's uh, that's something that India has begun to appreciate and kind of beginning to work on it. Uh, for instance, even though India has been in the space business for quite some for a few decades now, India has set up. Uh, a space situational awareness directorate only last uh, two years ago. So I think it's still, again, uh, very late in the day. We did have some sort of a capacity, some limited capacity prior to that, but I think uh, India has taken the issue of SSA uh, collaboration, SSA development on its own in, in terms of capabilities, but also in terms of partnering with other countries. And this is one of the least uh, uh, controversial sort of area for India to also to sort of uh, uh, open collaborative arrangements with other countries uh, because in Asia, I think by and large, the US has the largest network in terms of the radars and sensors, but followed by, I think, Russia has a uh, pretty good uh, coverage of the Southern uh, Hemisphere and so on and so forth, followed by Europe and so on and so forth. But I think in terms of Asia, Asian countries, they have had limited uh, capacities. China is beginning to develop some of it. Uh, Japan and India are also investing in this regard. But I think it's important that as more and more countries get invested in this, we need to have a clearer understanding that at most Sphere that we are uh, environment that we are operating in. So I think the importance is now uh, understood and acknowledged by the Indian leadership as well as Indian space leadership. So there is moment in that regard, but I think it's time to for India to kind of uh, jump on the front seat and uh, get into partnership agreements with other countries in terms of developing agreement, uh, developing agreements collaborative uh, so that we can share data, but also to develop larger networks so that we are able to have um, come to a, um, the operating picture in a sense. Okay, thank you. David or Frank, did you guys want to have any thoughts on this? Uh, the only thing I would say, Victoria, and I agree with everything Raji and Todd said is, don't forget the commercial space sector. Um, organizations like the Space Data Association, which track their satellites, the owner operators, uh, in orbit, there those satellites, they have really, really good data on where their uh, satellites are. So as we move forward with expanded cooperation in this area with governments, that's good. And I've been a big supporter of that throughout my career, but we also need to find a way to ensure we better integrate those commercial space actors. And just to piggyback on that, Frank's absolutely right. What the commercial industry is doing is phenomenal. Um, but also, I think the government has got to recognize what data is already out there uh, from commercial companies. And once you start to realize what's already out there, um, then you realize, okay, by withholding data on certain systems, 
you're not preventing anyone from knowing where something is or what it's doing. Um, you know, you're just making it more difficult <laughs> for, you know, for your own government uh, to share that information. So, you know, in many cases, we're not prohibiting information getting out there by the US government, keeping it, it you know, at a higher classification level. So we've got to recognize that. And that is in itself an incentive to just go ahead and be more transparent. More transparency is always a good thing. David, do you have anything to add on SSA sharing? Uh, Victoria, no, I mean, I couldn't agree more uh, with Todd, actually. Um, this idea that, you know, by somehow classifying the fact that uh, you, you want to control your data doesn't stop other people having their own data and then bringing in the commercial side of things. The one thing I would caution against, though, is um, when we talk commercial, I think we do need to make sure that we don't fight amongst ourselves as allies in trying to have uh, our companies or our systems uh, as the system. Um, I think the, the worst of all worlds outcome would be if the EU and the US get into an argument about what an SSA system ought to look like, uh, because it will simply allow other nations to um, drive the global debate and perhaps have their own systems being uh, acknowledged as the one. Um, I, I do think there's a, there's a real note of, of caution and, and it's an active discussion. And, and, I, and I, would, uh, I would hate it if, uh, if within ourselves we allowed, you know, if by fighting within ourselves, we allowed others to overtake us. Yeah, no circular firing squads, that'd probably be a good thing. Um, one of the questions, one of the common things that's shown up in a couple of the questions is how do you protect against cyber? whether it's a cyber attack of commercial elements that are then incorporated into a larger national space, ar space architecture or just cyber attacks against national assets. Um, and that's kind of the bet noir for space security, I think, because cyber is perceived and is being used currently. Um, so how do you defend against something that is so amorphous and hard to identify you know, where the attacker's coming and even if something's actually happened? Where, where do you, what's the panel's thoughts on this? I mean, it's certainly, you know, a difficult threat vector to protect against uh, encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. Uh, you'd be surprised uh, how many commercial systems uh, don't properly, you know, protect all of their data links going to and from the satellite and then through their ground networks as well. Um, and, but, you know, the biggest cyber, uh, 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 you know, method of entry into your system is likely to be your ground stations. And so that's that's where countries really need to double down on their efforts. And that's where, you know, I think governments can step in, uh, especially for commercial uh, companies and setting up, you know, stricter cybersecurity standards. Like the U.S. government has made some steps in that direction, uh, but they're really more guidelines at this point. But, you know, setting up cybersecurity standards that private space, you know, companies that are operating satellites have to follow. Uh, and then having meaningful inspections uh, that those standards are being adhered to. I think that would be a big step forward. Anyone else? All right, Todd solved it. Thank you, Todd. Um, <laughs> um, I like to actually, we're getting, I know we're over on time and we have so many questions. We could probably continue this for another hour, but um, I would just like to, you know, give our panelists all the opportunity to have like one final thought. If you wanted, you know, the people, the, 300 plus people that are listening in right now, if you want to have one takeaway about how do you ensure to defend you know, satellites against attack and what sort of things we need to move forward, what would you like them to have? What, what is the one thing you'd like them to know or priority you'd like them to have? Um, and um, with that, I'm gonna let Todd have last say. So maybe David, since you were the last to present, do you wanna be the first to give your last thoughts? Thanks, Victoria. Uh, so my last thoughts would be, um, space is part of everything else that we do. So in, in, in the threats piece, um, it's about modern deterrence, about a holistic view, and about making sure that uh, any threats against space systems are understood to be threats against much more than just a satellite in space. Um, the point about cyber, the point about the ground infrastructure, um, the point about the fact this is linked to nuclear and so on, um, my, my parting thought would be the reason that we lead this work at the UN uh, is because we are starting to build a global understanding of the fact that you can't just attack a satellite and get away with it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Raji? Yes, yeah, sure. 
Let me also link it up to the last question that you asked on the cyber. So I think, uh, like I said, in the, when you talk about the global governance and ways to deal with some of these uh, current uh, more contemporary threats, consensus is the key issue there. The lack of consensus among the major powers has become the biggest stumbling block in developing effective rules of the road, whether it is political agreements that you're talking about or more binding legal instruments that you're talking about. And especially when you talk about some of the counter space threats, not so much in the case of the ASATs, for instance. Uh, I think uh, uh, on, at what at, at what is the kind of uh, uh, framework will you have in terms of building consensus? Uh, for instance, if there is an attack, um, a cyber attack on a particular state, uh, how would you agree that there has been an attack? Even if you are able to trace back the perpetrator, how will you sort of? Uh, uh, come to a clearer understanding, develop an agreement among all the powers that this is this attack has happened, and what do you what do you do, and what kind of response mechanism will you come about? Uh, I think it's going to be more difficult to reach an agreement on these questions when a state or a private sector corporation, for instance, has used uh, a cyber attack to steal some data or uh, interfere, but it's it has not really led to a physical destruction and so on and so forth. So I think it's always going to be a tricky affair, and developing countermeasures are going to be seriously problematic. But I think uh, the need to work towards uh, developing some norms, I think that is far, uh, far too important uh, because uh, over the, um, some of the norms that have prevailed for decades on have really got diluted, uh, whether it's in, in terms of the norm of not testing ASAT capable, ASAT weapons. I think that prevailed for a couple of decades. That has been broken in the recent times. Uh, norm of uh, not to interfere in each of those uh, um, space activities, I think space assets in creating disturbances and disruptions. I think this is again being broken, diluted and so on and so forth in recent times. So I couldn't agree with the fact that we need to develop new rules of the road. And I think the UK proposal is particularly uh, very interesting because one, it does not come with a prescriptive approach. I, it, is, uh, it, it gives the states uh, plenty of options, opportunities to uh, come out with identifying threats and challenges from a national security perspective, from their national perspective, rather than you know you coming out with this, uh, the list of uh, threats and challenges. So I think the time is uh, it's critical because the threats are growing and uh, the norms of uh, norms and new forms of uh, uh, rules of the road are absolutely important. Because, and uh, I think we need to try different ways to. Uh, get to some sort of an understanding and to uh, get to that maybe start with smaller technical agreements like i said rather than looking at overarching agreements thank great you. thank you raji okay frank if you had to distill your thoughts down to you know one takeaway for the audience what would that be well it really builds on the point that david ended on uh, and that is you can't separate space from these other strategic technologies to include nuclear, cyber, missile defense. Indeed, I teach a course in the graduate program at Georgetown on space security, but the title of the course is Space Strategic Technologies in the Future of International Security. And the point I try to get across to my students is that really these are all integrated technologies. And the United States and its allies, if we are going to be successful in managing this competitive um, environment, we are going to have to think in these ways. Now, the interesting thing is that the Russians and the Chinese are thinking in these ways. I mean, they, the Chinese, for example, have the strategic support force, which brings together cyber uh, space and electronic warfare. The Russians have the aerospace forces, which bring together the air and space domain. Uh, one of my big concerns is that we in the United States and the West in general don't think in these broad strategic ways when it comes to these information technologies. And I think it's gonna be really important as we move forward that uh, we think intellectually in this way, but also from an organizational structure within the individual departments of the US government, across the interagency, and with our alliances and partnerships around the world. Let me stop there. Thank you, Frank. All right, Todd, you wanna to bring us home? <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, my, my big takeaway, uh, I would summarize it in five words. Uh, stop building big, juicy targets. Uh, <laughs> that's the one number one thing uh, the U.S. government uh, can do to improve space security, I think, at this point. Um, but yeah, I, you know, also with the final word, I want to thank you, Victoria, for being our, our, our wonderful moderator for this event and for co-sponsoring the event uh, with us at CSIS. Oh, it's been our pleasure. Secure World has really enjoyed working with you guys at CSIS. And um, of course, all our panelists, I'd like to thank you all for joining and sharing your input and um, looking forward to continuing this conversation as a space security continues to evolve. Um, I'd like to point out that this event has been recorded. The video will be up on CSIS and Secure World's website soon-ish. Um, and um, we're all available on email, Twitter. So please feel free to reach out, continue the conversation. Thank you all so much. We appreciate you allowing us to go a little long and everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.